Uh, in this webinar, Dr. Rachel Newsom from the lab of Dr. Christian Jobin at the University of uh, Florida will present data on her study of the influence of Bacteroides enhanced gut microbiomes on non-small cell lung cancer patient response to anti-PD-1 therapy. Dr. Newsom received her PhD in 2023 from the University of Florida in cancer biology and clinical and translational science. Dr. Newsom was named the 2023 inaugural UF Health Cancer Center Researcher on the Rise, and the work she will talk about today was selected as the UF Innovate Invention of the Year in 2023. Dr. Newsom is currently a postdoctoral associate in the lab of Dr. Christian Jobin. So without further delay, I'll turn the time over to Dr. Rachel Newsom. Today, I'm going to be talking about work that we've been doing in the lab of Christian Jobin at the UF Health Cancer Center um, in partnership with Isolation Bio. And so the title of the talk today is Small Microbes Make a Big Impact in Cancer Immunotherapy. So to start, we all know, and this point has been belabored many times, we know that the number of bacterial cells outnumber the number of human cells. And the reason this isn't immediately obvious is because their biomass is so tiny compared to ours. But what they do far outnumber us in is gene content. When you look at the number of microbial genes compared to the number of human genes, and this doesn't take into account alternative splicing, but you get the picture that there is so much genetic content in these microbes. And a lot of it's uncharacterized. Now, the vast majority of the microbes in and on our bodies reside in the gut. And so we know that the balance of microbes in our gut can regulate the balance between health and disease. And the disease we're most interested here in at the UF Health Cancer Center is cancer, of course. And so lung cancer is the leading cause of death by cancer. Um, 2023 will continue to be in 2024. Now, non-small cell lung cancer represents about 80% of these lung cancer cases. And when it comes to distant metastatic disease, your five-year relative survival rate just plummets to below 10%. And so a new therapy in the clinic that seeks to address this is immune checkpoint inhibition. And so when it comes to distant metastatic disease, you can give these monoclonal antibodies to patients. And so what it really tries to do is interrupt this interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1 and other um, anti-autoimmune signaling pathways like CKLA4 um, can also be targets of immune checkpoint inhibition. But this is just one example. And so the tumor cell can overexpress these ligands. And then when a T cell interacts with the tumor cell and detects an antigen, it can actually just be turned off when you don't have that interruption of that interaction. And so what immune checkpoint inhibition does is it takes the foot off the brake when it comes to T cell or immune cell interaction with tumors. But when it comes to patients that actually benefit from this therapy, you can see that a minority of patients do benefit. And of those patients that do benefit, non-small cell lung cancer is actually one of the largest. I mean, it's less than 10 to 20 percent. And it's kind of irrespective of PD-L1 expression status. So regardless of how much PD-L1 that the tumor expresses, you do get a small subset of patients that do respond. And they respond very well with almost complete remission of disease. But for those patients that don't respond, we want to know why. And so one thing we seek to do here is to find out how do you step on the gas? We have the foot off the brake with this immune cell tumor signaling, but how do you cause an immune cell to kill tumor? And so we look at both tumor intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Now, Extrinsic factors that modify ICI efficacy that are very difficult to modify are circulating immune factors, germline genetics of the tumor, even body phenotype. These do impact response rates. But when you look at some of these factors that are easily modifiable, you can see the gut microbiome and then these external exposures. So we seek to look at how we can modify the gut microbiome, influence immune checkpoint response. Now, there was a very famous trio of science papers published in 2018 that showed exactly this, that both responders and non-responders to immune checkpoint blockade have a different gut microbial composition. Now they found different bacteria, were enriched in responders, but 
when they took those feces and planted them in mice with an avatar tumor, they recapitulated the response of their original donor. And what this looks like in the tumor is responders will have an increased infiltration of CD8 T cells. And those CD8 T cells are generally activated, so effector CD8s. These express a lot of interferon gamma. They have um, very cytotoxic immune phenotype, whereas non-responders have an increased infiltration of T regulatory cells. These are T cells that express pro or anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, TGF-beta, and that's less helpful when it comes to tumor cell killing. So our thought was, well, let's look at non-small cell lung cancer. And what is the gut microbiome profile of a responder. Now, when it comes to responder patients in non-small cell lung cancer, about 20% of patients respond. And this is represented in green here. And two previous studies have actually been done looking at the gut microbial composition of responders and non-responders to PD-1 therapy. So there was the original study in science in 2018, Rowdy et al. had profiled a small population of non-small cell lung cancer patients, and then there was a larger Korean cohort in 2021. But interestingly, each of these studies found that the same bacteria was enriched in differential cohorts. So some found it was enriched in non-responders, some found it was enriched in responders. And you would say, how is that? How is that possible? Well, we have an idea now. And we did a meta-analysis, in fact, of the three science papers in 2018. What we found was if you build a rock curve based just on microbial relative abundance of responders and non-responders, you can barely break that 50% coin flip probability. But when you build a rock curve on microbial gene content, you can really boost the predictive value um, so that makes us think that it's actually the genes and the products of the bacteria that define whether they can be responder associated or non-responder associated. So we actually partnered with Moffitt Cancer Center in 2016. They had run this stage three and four non-small cell lung cancer trial. So this is distant metastatic disease. These patients had been on a ton of lines of therapy, chemotherapy, um, radiation, surgical resection, et cetera, and they all received immune checkpoint inhibitors for the first time. So we enrolled 64 patients. And what was really novel about this prospect of study was that we collected baseline fecal samples of these patients before they underwent treatment. And then we also got post-treatment fecal samples. We were able to define whether these patients were responders or non-responders based on rhesus criteria. We had a really stringent category for responders. So responders had to have a partial or complete response, stable or progressive disease is considered non-response. Some studies stable is considered maybe a responder. We wanted to see some sort of regression in our responder patients. Now we performed RNA DNA isolation on these fecal samples that we had collected, performed 16S RNA sequencing and RNA sequencing that I'll talk about. But what was really innovative here was that of these 64 patients we enrolled, at baseline, we also collected a paired sample of their feces, and this is in a liquid dental transport media. So this was to preserve viability pre-analysis. And what we found when we profiled this cohort was that responders have, of course, a different microbial community structure than non-responders, and this was expected. And then when you look at their bacterial transcriptome, responders also have a very different transcriptome than non-responders. Now, Looking a little deeply, we wanted to see, well, okay, do our preserved feces recapitulate the response of their original responders? So we took these feces, we pooled them by response phenotypes. There are four patients who were pooled for a responder fecal transplant, six for a non-responder fecal transplant. We gavaged them in this isopositive bioexclusion system. So what this does actually, it's kind of like a germ-free isolator, but it's more portable. It allows you to actually measure tumors throughout the experiment. It's a bit of a pain to work with, but really allows you to humanize mice with bacteria and perform these complex experiments on them. So we got these mice with their fecal donors, and then we performed a subcutaneous implantation with uh, Lewis lung carcinoma cells. Now, these are non-responsive to single-agent checkpoint therapy, and they're incredibly aggressive. So 
we implanted the mice with these tumors and then we treated them with PD-1 or isotype every three days while collecting feces weekly. And then at endpoint, we looked at tumor size and we harvested the tumors for facts. And what we find is that responders do indeed have decreased tumor growth compared to non-responders. Um, and by responder, non-responder, I mean mice humanized with the feces of responders or non-responders. This is also reflected in the tumor weight. And what we also found is that the responder tumors have an increased infiltration of these interferon gamma positive CD8 T cells compared to non-responders. And they also have increased population of these Th1 type CD4 T helper cells. These are kind of the opposite of the Treg cells. They actually do express interferon gamma and TNF alpha, and they can help activate CD8 T cells. So our thinking now was, okay, we've profiled the gut microbiome of these patients. If we modify the gut microbiome, we can see an effect on tumor response in a distant tumor. Now, our question was, is this because the bacteria are in the gut producing something that is then um, having a long distance effect or are our bacteria actually translocating to the tumor? And there have been a lot of critiques lately in commentary about the presence of a tumor microbiome. So we really wanted to um, eliminate this possibility. So what we did was we repeated the experiment and saw the same effect with responder feces causing a decrease in tumor growth after treatment. And we profiled the tumors by 16S sequencing and also qPCR. And what we found is that our tumors, compared to our feces, have absolutely no signature of bacteria in them. But when you look at the feces, of course, a huge amount. Um, so our thinking now was that this is a long distance effect coming from the gut microbiome. So we knew that our human cohort had 100% of their original responder-associated taxa. And when we implanted that into our humanized responder mice, we got about 60% transference of the original responder-associated taxa. And so what we then wanted to look at was the overlapping taxa signature between these two cohorts, and if that would clarify the bacterial signature between the two. And so what we did was we looked at the log fold change of different ASVs, so amplicon sequence variants in the responder feces of mice and humans overlapping uh, between responders and at the left and the top uh, or non-responders at the bottom towards the right. And you can see on the left-hand side, these are all of the A these are all uh, ASCs belonging to the genera listed at the bottom. And you can see you actually get ASVs that are enriched equally and oppositely between the two response cohorts. And I really want to illustrate this here with looking at acromancia. You get an ASV that's enriched in responders and an ASV that's enriched in non-responders. And so that's a little bit concerning for us. And when we looked at the strongest signature of response, we find that bacteroides are definitely mostly enriched in the responders, but they're also equally and oppositely enriched in the non-responders. So we know that we can see at a bacterial species level of resolution that the bacteria are enriched in responders and non-responders, and they are different. So you know the, the classification, kingdom, domain, um, phylum class order, family, genus, species, but you can actually go beneath species. So we wanted to know, are there differences at the subspecies level? And is there unique gene content? Is there unique phenotypes belonging to responder bacteria that make them more beneficial to a cancer patient? And so looking at this scale of less precise, to more precise, we wanted to take it from a fecal microbiota transplant to specific bacterial consortia. And to do this, we partnered with Isolation Bio and their incredibly powerful platform, the Prospector, to engineer a consortium of responder feces-derived isolates. So we wanted to focus on the bacteroides specifically because we had seen that so clearly in our mouse and human cohorts. So the first step is essentially cultivating our microbes in an array. So if we had taken our feces from our responder mice that had responded to immunotherapy in our tumor model, and we just simply took fecal pellets from them, freshly collected, 
a homogenizes an anaerobic buffer and froze aliquots down. And the way this kind of works is you're able to dilute your sample super far, load it on an array, and incubate it. And simply the decrease in fluorescent signal over time will show you in a 6,000 well of nanoliter volume where you have growing bacterial isolates. Now you dilute it so far that it's almost impossible to get two bacterial cells per well. And this is done through a very innovative um, vacuum seal loading array system, uh, which you can kind of see here. And so what we ended up doing was exactly that, taking our mass fecal samples, diluting them. And then when you image these arrays with the automated prospector system, you're able to see a decrease in fluorescent signal shown by the blue here. And you can see it's a nice spread in this array. And the prospector does automated harvesting of these unique slow growing bacterial isolates. So we're able to image these arrays very quickly, very simply. And then looking at the fluorescence at baseline versus activation, we're able to see those wells that have no change, those wells that have a fluorescence reduction. And we tell the prospector we want to take these bugs. And so the prospector is actually designed to use a variety of different medias. And so because we wanted to look at bacterial metabolites and natural products, we actually ended up selecting a media that had not been tested with the prospector platform at that time. Uh, the mega media is a very rich media. It's undefined because of certain ingredients in there, but it's known to support the growth of diverse anaerobic, specifically anaerobic bacteria, and it really pushes metabolite production. It gives bacteria all the ingredients they need to produce all the bacterial metabolites they could possibly imagine. And so looking at an array that we had done with Mega Media, you can see we got an incredible growth. And this growth was actually pretty quick. I mean, just two days in anaerobic culture and these microarrays, we were able to see an excellent distribution of growing isolates versus not growing blank wells. So our workflow then became using the prospector system and the nanoliter microarrays, we would take our stool sample, we would incubate it, um, dilute it in mega media, do the incubation for about two days. We'd image these arrays. We would have the prospector do automated transfer. We'd grow up these 96 well plates, maybe for two days, make a quick glycerol stock. So we have a nice catalog storage of these isolates, store them in minus 80. And then in an additionally high throughput manner, we would take these glycerol stocks, make secondary cultures, and then ID them by Maldi-Toff biotype or analysis. And I'll talk a little bit about how we did that. Um, the biggest challenge with the Maldi-Toff biotyper was that traditionally used with solid agar cultures. So what we ended up doing was adapting it to a liquid culture platform. We would grow our isolates, in a deep well 96 well plate with mega media for about two days. And we would spin those pellets down. We would do a quick rinse with a microbiology grade water. And this is all in the anaerobic chamber. So we keep them in the anaerobic chamber until the very end when we would um, streak these target plates. And so a sample preparation for the Maldi biotyper was pretty simple. We would just grow our isolates in a 96 well plate format. And then we would pellet and wash each of the 96 cell plates. We'd streak them in duplicate on a target plate for the Maldi Toff, quickly overlay it with formic acid matrix, and then we would run it on the Sirius biotyper, which we actually have here in house at UF in our ICBR core. And so you, here you can see just an example of one of the target plates we've run. We just simply, you just take a little bit of the pellet, scrape it on to the little well, let it dry, overlay it with matrix and formic acid, and then you're done, super fast. And then actually running these samples, each sample takes a couple seconds to run on our system. So just load up the plate and then it compares the protein reference spectra um, with unknown spectra coming from your sample. And if it's able to make a close match, it'll give you a genus and species ID for your bacteria. So this is incredibly valuable because as you know, a 16S analysis, sometimes you can only get down to maybe the genus or even family level. So having a species ID for all of these isolates in a high throughput manner was incredibly helpful. I mean, this whole process saves so much incredible time. 
for us, especially as we were, you know, racing to to phenotype these bacteria. And as you can see from the responder mouse fecal samples, we were able to cultivate diverse library of isolates. Um, a lot of these were Bacteroides, which is our target genera. We did build a library that did also have um, several non-Bacteroides species, but we ended up going with the Bacteroides um, genus alone, just because of the signature we had seen in our human and mouse cohorts. So looking at this library, and this built just from mega media, we had 183 human bacteroides isolates from a total of 679. And this was also 18 unique species of bacteroides isolates out of these 183. And so we did a classical look at what kind of a small molecule would actually um, stimulate a T cell from these bacteria isolates. So we would grow up these isolates in the depot plate, culture them under anaerobic culture, and then we actually filtered the bacteria for their cell-free supernatant. So this would separate the bacteria themselves from their natural products, which is what we were theorizing was causing this long distance effect. And then we would add a 1 to 100 dilution, stimulate CD8 T cells from SPF wild type mice with these supernatants, cold culture, and then run a flow cytometry panel to look at interferon gamma stimulation. And so these would be naive CD8 T cells, pre-antigen detection. And what we found was, although the vast majority of isolates didn't produce any um, significant stimulation, we did get six isolates out of the 183 that caused robust stimulation of interferon gamma production from these naive T cells. And this is in comparison to PMA ionomycin, which is a very big co-stim um, activation signal. So this is kind of the nuclear bomb. And we were getting activation close to PMA ionomycin with these isolate supernatants at a 1 to 100 dilution. So we were excited. We decided to call these six Bacteroides isolates, the six consort. And we decided to see, okay, well, we know they stimulate CD8 T cells in vitro. What about in vivo? Do they confer the responder phenotype that we got from the fecal transplant from responder patients? So in the ISO cage, we did either a responder or non responder fecal transplant. And then we also did a transplant of just the six consort. And again, this is an isopositive bio exclusion system. So this is all that's there this is the six consort or the fecal transplant. We performed this in the same tumor model as previous. And what we found was that the six consort recapitulated the response of the responder feces. They both significantly decreased tumor growth compared to the non-responder feces. And additionally, really with the six consort, we got an influx in these CD8 positive interferon gamma positive T cells going to the tumor. That was even, and it wasn't significant, but it was even seen to be elevated above the responder feces phenotype. So what we then did was look to see, okay, well, what is the colonization of these six bacteria? Are we getting one bacteria that's just overriding the rest or are we seeing an equal distribution here? So we had collected feces from this mouse model, both at baseline and then after treatment. And so we ended up looking through 16S sequencing to see, okay, do we see the six bacteria? And they actually colonize relatively stably. This is at baseline, this is that endpoint, you can see there's no huge difference in bacterial relative abundance between the six isolates that we had. Here, we can't really categorize them down to the species level because this is 16S and we hadn't done whole genome uh, sequencing yet, but you can see the representation of the six is here and pretty stable across time. Now, our next question was, well, is the six consort synergizing with anti-PD-1 or is this a direct effect of the bacteria on tumor response to immune checkpoint? So we again colonized mice in the isopositive system with the six consort, with the difference being that after implantation with tumor cells, we either gave them an injection of PD-1 or we just gave them ice type control, so treated or untreated. And looking at tumor size, really the six consort needs that anti-PD-1 to mediate this effect. So it's not something that is directly caused by the bacteria just being there. It's a synergistic effect. 
so next, our question was then, well, is this dependent on what we had actually screened these bacteria for, which was interferon gamma stimulation? Is this how the six contour is enhancing the anti-PD-1 therapy response? So again, in the isopause exclusion system, we colonize mice with the six consort or non-responder feces in our tumor model and injected them with anti-PD-1, of course with the caveat that a second group from each of these cohorts will also receive every other day anti-interferon gamma depletion. Now, we realize that interferon gamma is necessary for just anti-PD response in general, but what we wanted to see was, do we are we able to dampen response in the R consort without anti-interferon gamma as opposed to the non-responder cohort? And what we found was exactly that. When you deplete interferon gamma, when you give six consort to these mice, you significantly raise tumor growth over time, basically back to untreated levels. But in non-responder tumors, they both don't respond to begin with. And then when you deplete inter interferon gamma, there's really no significant difference in response. They just both don't respond. And looking at the circulating serum interferon gamma levels, you see that Interferon gamma is only elevated in mice that have the six consort, not elevated in mice with non-responder feces. And that when you deplete interferon gamma, you return that back down to the level of non-responder feces. This also goes for the intratumoral interferon gamma positive CD8 cells. Looking at the tumor, you only have elevated interferon gamma positive CD8s in the tumor in mice that receive the six consort, not in those that have a non-responder and then depleting interferon gamma returns it down to baseline levels. So our theory was that at this point, the bacteria were mediating anti-tumor response through an interferon gamma dependent mechanism. Now, we wanted to get even more precise. So we have these bacterial isolates that we phenotyped to be able to enhance response in mice, but what are they actually producing that's causing this? And so what we had done was a little bit more specific assay than we had previously. And so with the power of the prospector system, although we also had these sex consort stimulating isolates, we had taxonomy matched non-stimulatory isolates. Same genus and species as the six consort, just non-stimulatory, which is incredibly powerful for us. So we're able to have the same 16S composition if you give mice these six non-stimulatory isolates, but you'd have response in one cohort, no response in the other. And so what we now screen for with our six consort isolates versus the non-stimulatory consort was if you stimulate with cell-free supernatant, do you get response? And then secondly, if you only take small molecules, and we define this as molecules that are smaller than about three kilodaltons, we use the molecular weight cutoff filter to do this, do we still get response after you filter just for small molecules? And then we perform the same cytometric analysis we've done previously, and we found that the six consort after the three kilodalton filtration maintained the stimulatory phenotype of the non-filtered six consort, whereas the non-stimulatory consort did not at any level stimulate RCD8 positive T cells. So we were really excited to see that it was probably a small molecule, maybe a soluble factor. And so we have these excellent collaborators at Yale, Dr. Jason Crawford and Dr. Jun Suk Oh. They're both in the Department of Chemistry and Biomolecular Design and Discovery at Yale. And they have an incredibly powerful platform there. And this, you can read about it in their science paper from about two years ago. But you can fractionate a small molecule supernatant from bacteria, screen for activity, and actually find ion features associated with activation. So we did exactly this. We sent off a single isolate that was stimulatory from our six consort to them compared to a mega media control. And we did this in many replicates of cultures. And we filtered the cell-free supernatant from these. So what Yale did was vacuum liquid chromatography to concentrate these supernatants. And then they crudely fractionated this by size using chromatography into six different fractions. Now they sent these six fractions back to us at UF and we screened them with our same assay we had done previously, CD8 positive T cells by flow cytometry for interferon gamma production. 
This showed us that fraction six was the only one that maintained this stimulatory effect. So then they took fraction six, we sent it back to them, and they performed HPLC fractionation to fractionate fraction six into 12 subsequent fractions. Now, we each of these 12 fractions from both the isolate and the media control, we tested again with the same assay. And what we found was that only one fraction, fraction 11, had high simulatory ability compared to PMA and the original supernatant, which is very exciting. So we knew there was some secret ingredient in this fraction 11 that was causing this. So we told Yale, okay, it's fraction 11. So they asked us to do a larger scale cultivation. This ended up only having to be one liter. We did this in anaerobic media. And then we sent this huge supernatant back to them and they performed LCMSMS and tandem NR and MRMS to look at specific ion features in this fraction 11. And then after looking for these specific ion features, they ran them through computational pipelines for structure prediction. And we found one small molecule that was produced in fraction 11 and simulates the interferon gamma production. And that's not found in our media. It's not found in any other fraction from that bacteria. So we decided to call this small molecule VAC-429. And what it is, is a proprietary structure <laughs> that I cannot reveal to you today, but we are under review right now in Nature Cancer. And what it is, is a small molecule that's produced naturally in two different configurations, cis and trans. And in a dose-dependent manner, this small molecule stimulates interferon gamma production from naive CD8 T cells in a dose-dependent manner, specifically when it's in the cis configuration. Yale also synthesized a non-naturally occurring derivative with a saturated double bond at the location of the cis or trans in the previous structures. What we found was this completely abrogated any effect that the small molecule it had on these T cells. And so our thinking was that this cis configuration is important for the activity of the small molecule. And so what we then went back to was, okay, this is active in vitro, but does it matter in our mouse model? So we went back to our mouse model of the six consort bacteria that had been treated with anti-PD-1. We had collected feces at baseline in these mice. So we took these feces, we also took feces from germ-free mice and SPF mice, and we sent the TL for metabolic profiling. And what we find is that we only see this elevated BAC-429 production and detection in the feces of our six consort mice. So only there, we were not able to detect it in germ-free mice, not able to detect it in SPF mice. And what we also know is that germ-free mice and SPF mice do not respond to anti-PD-1. So this is exciting for us. But then we decided to look at the six consort isolates themselves. So to your right, you can see, or sorry, to your left, you can see the six isolates um, by their code name, by their location in their 96 l plate, actually. And we did triplicate cultures of each one and sent them for metabolic analysis at Yale. And what they found was that there is highly differential production of BAC-429 in each of these isolates. And it's actually pretty stable across different cultures. So some of these produce a lot, some of these produce less, and their production actually directly correlates with the interferon gamma stimulation of the isolates themselves. And you can look at that correlation to your, your right, I guess here. And so we were very excited about this. And so what we were also thinking is, well, what could be responsible for the production of cis BAC-429 in these bacteria? And so we had actually done whole genome assembly of three of the simulatory strains in our six consort and three of our non-simulatory strains. And this is just an example. So this is the xylanosolvins isolate M2H3 of our six consort the simulatory strain. And this is our taxonomy match B xylanosolvins isolate M1D10, but this is non-simulatory in vitro. And after whole genome assembly, we looked at subsystem and gene content in these bacteria. And what we find is that the biggest difference between the stimulatory and non-stimulatory strains is their metabolism. 
Now looking in more detail at the metabolism, you can see that the number of unique genes belonging to the stimulatory bacteroid strain M2H3 versus the number of unique genes belonging to M1D10 is very different when it comes to metabolism. You have far more unique genes belonging to metabolism in our stimulatory strain. And looking at those pathway classes belonging to metabolism, you see far more unique genes belonging to a ton of different important groups, such as fatty acids, lipids, protein synthesis, carbohydrates. And we actually built a network analysis comparing these two isolates. And you can just see the huge enrichment of unique gene content belonging to all of these important groups versus non-simulatory isolate. And these, again, these are the same genus and species, but so very different when they come to their metabolic activity. So the last thing we wanted to do was actually see if this small molecule that we had found from our fractionation analysis was important in vivo and could enhance response to anti-PD-1. So we, we actually ended up using, different from our previous models, was a bilocal tumor model. The reason for this is for our novel small molecule, we want to do a local tumor microdose injection. Now, to control for both a direct injection of a novel and previously unseen compound into these mice, we use both the cis active version of BAC429, and as a control, we use the saturated version. So this has no activity that we've seen, so this synthetic version will inhibit that interferon gamma production from T cells, but it's still a novel compound being injected directly into a tumor. So it'll control for any off-target effects there. And additionally, we had a second distant untreated tumor. So this did not receive a local tumor microdose. And what we injected into this injected tumor was such a tiny concentration that you would only achieve the active concentrated needed for stimulation in this single tumor. If the small molecule is able to translocate to the other tumor, you wouldn't see an effect. So if we saw a decrease in the distant untreated tumor, this would mean that T cells would have to be translocating from our local tumor to our distant tumor. And of course, we still used our lung cancer, non-responsive to anti-PD-1. We follow the same schematic as previously. So we had SPF mice implanted with Lewis lung cancer cells. We performed our intratumoral injection on the same day as the anti-PD-1 injection with that microdose of the saturated, so inactive, or cis BAC429 active version. And then we looked at the tumor size and um, harvested them for flow cytometry at endpoint. And what we find is that only cis 429 in combination with anti-PD-1 reduce the combined tumor volume. So on the left-hand side, this is the total tumor volume of the mouse itself, so both the local and distant tumor. You can see compared to cis 429 alone, significantly decreased tumor growth um, after treatment and also compared to the DMSO isotype control. Now, when you look at the saturated version, there's absolutely no difference in tumor growth um, compared to untreated. So we're very excited to see this, but we wanted to see if we also see this phenotype we'd seen in our mouse model with the synthetic small molecule. And we actually do only in the mice that receive the combination of our small molecule plus anti-PD-1 do we actually see this driven infiltration of interferon gamma positive CD8 T cells to the tumor. Now looking separately at the directly injected tumor, so on the left-hand side, this is just tumor volume in the directly injected tumor. You still see this decrease in the directly injected tumor that does not exist with the synthetic inactive version. But perhaps most interestingly, when you combine this treatment in the satellite tumor, you see almost the biggest decrease in growth um, compared to the untreated version. This is more than 50% decrease in tumor growth over time in a very non-responsive model. Whereas with the saturated version in this distant tumor, you do not get any decrease compared to untreated. So we're very excited about that. Um, and so really the conclusion of all of this work was that the microbiome from responder patients do contain an enrichment of bacteroides. And some of these bacteroides do produce this novel small molecule, this N-acyl amide is the type of molecule it's called. 
and it induces interferon gamma activation of naive CD8 T cells. And when that does encounter a tumor in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors, you do get this potent tumor cell killing in a previously resistant tumor. And so our current work really tries to address, you know, why this is happening, where it's happening, and how it's happening. So our biggest question is, even with a bilocal tumor model, do we get local or distant interaction of metabolites with immune cells? In our bacteria model, where we put the six consort in these germ-free mice, we still see this anti-tumor effect. So you do not need the metabolite to be in the tumor. Now, we don't know if the metabolite can translocate from the gut to the tumor. We don't know what that concentration would look like. And so what we're doing now is profiling the concentrations in naturally produced uh, metabolite with the six consort in our mice model versus those that receive it synthetically and see where is the active concentration found. Additionally, where is the immune cell target? Where is this happening? What's the receptor? What's the mechanism? We know that it does activate CD8 T cells, but could it also activate dendritic cells, other antigen presenting cells? How would it do this? Where is it happening? Is it happening in the gut, in the periphery, in the tumor? Those are questions we're trying to address. Um, also, the role of diet, when you look at the carbohydrate metabolism in the stimulatory versus non-stimulatory isolates, you do see this very differential, unique gene content between the two relating to carbohydrate. And so what we want to see, if you reduce carbohydrate intake, can you boost production of BAC429 or do you decrease production of BAC429? And what kind of consequences does this have for patients who are on these therapies? Uh, we're also trying to app optimize the bioactivity and bioavailability of the novel small molecule, um, in addition to looking at the genetic elements that are controlling the production. So what unique G content would possibly contribute to production of our novel small molecule? Where is it found in the bacteria? How is it getting there? Is this a um, trans element? So is it coming from other bacteria through horizontal gene transfer? Is it part of maybe a prophage gene, we don't know that yet. So we're looking at all of these directions currently, but really all of this work has been made possible by our partnership with Isolation Bio. If we weren't able to phenotype those individual bacterial strains from our patients, we wouldn't have found our small molecule, we wouldn't be where we are. So we really want to thank all of our partners there, especially Dr. Talia Jewell, who's been incredibly helpful in and getting feedback on different experiments I want to try. Of course, Lance Page has helped with our machine so much, Shreka, and then Todd Kruger there. Um, and of course, all of our great partners in our lab here and at Yale, Dr. Jason Crawford, Dr. Jun Suk Oh, and Wendy John have been incredibly instrumental in getting this project to where it is. And of course, all of our core facilities. And with that, I conclude the presentation. Love to take questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, yeah. Rachel. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions and we have Sarika and Talia joining us from the Isolation Bio team. Perfect. I do see one question already from Isabel Walls. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. So she asked, very interesting, what are the sources of these six consort bacteria, soil, water, foods? How did they get into our gut? This is actually a very good question. We don't know how they would get there and why they would be differentially abundant in their first place between responders and non-responders. Um, of course, intake is important into colonization of bacteria in your gut, but even just as equally important is what you're eating to support the growth and sustained growth of bacteria in your gut. So it would be interesting to see a um, longitudinal study looking at this, you know, from when a person, <laughs> ideally when a person is born and from when they develop cancer, you know, when did these bacteria first pop up? Why? When did they grow in relative abundance? But at this point, we really don't know. Alrighty, we have some additional questions. Uh, how much sample did you use uh, for the isolation and was sample fresh or frozen? Yeah, so for the isolation, we had collected flash frozen feces um, from our mice. So these are mice that had been given the fecal transplant from our patients. Um, so from each mouse, you can pretty much get an unlimited amount of fecal pellets, just how much time you're willing to spend with the mice to get those. We ended up using, and I believe it was about 
three grams, which is not much. And we pulled them from all of the responder mice in our cohort. So we took those three grams and we divided that by into aliquots. I think it was 10 different aliquots of a mil each. So the dilution was maybe one to 10. Um, and then for each isolation, <laughs> you don't need very much of that input material. I think we ended up using maybe three microliters of input for dilution into the resorufin and mega media, and then to put that on the array. So you're using tiny, tiny, tiny quantities. Uh, we still have plenty of stool from these original mice that we could do whatever we want with. Oh, right. I see another question from Salma Youssef. So she asked, can you clarify what you put onto the prospector microarray? What goes into each well of the microarray? Yeah, okay. So I maybe went too fast on that um, part. Okay, well, my slides catch up to me. So what goes onto the prospector microarray is stool from our mice, super diluted and mega media. And to that, I just add a little bit of the resorufin indicator. And then that is what's vacuum loaded into the microarray. It's simply just that. And this is all done under aseptic conditions. So everything's pre-autoclave going in, everything's done with sterile tools. So you know that it's just your bacteria that are going onto the microarray. And then you can actually use whatever media you want to do that with. We ended up going with mega media, but any media that doesn't already contain maybe huge amounts of uh, resorufin would probably be useful on this. Um, I'm sure Shreka can speak more to that. Sorry, I'm going all the way back. I can add just a little bit more about the, the media. So yeah, we do have a lot of media that has been validated for the prospector. We've started using mega media in-house as well due to Rachel's uh, suggestion and it's been working great for us. Um, the amount of resorufin or resazarin in the media doesn't seem to be an issue so much unless you have bacteria that are highly sensitive to it, which we haven't observed with human fecal samples. Right. Another question. Uh, if I had a population that has a mix of fast growers and some that grow very slowly, can a prospector isolate both uh, as part of the same workflow? Yeah, so I could speak to that. I'm sure Talia can as well. They have more experience with it. But we were able to get very fast growers. So Bacteroides grow incredibly quickly, usually one day or two days. So we would actually set up different arrays for different bacteria we wanted to get out. Some arrays we would just harvest after two days and we'd say these are probably all Bacteroides and be done with it. If we wanted a little bit more of that slow growing diversity, what we would do was load the array, image it at two days, see what grew, and then use that as a filter for comparing to what grew at five days and then subtracting those and just taking what had grown in the space between two days and five days. Um, and that's how we, you know, we, we ended up getting the slow growers and the fast growers. Yeah, yeah. Talia, you wanna? You, you, you got it in a nutshell. That's exactly what we do as well. Uh, and we it's very simple on the, the user yeah. end. I mean, really it's not very difficult. <laughs> We do recommend loading uh, multiple biological arrays so you can take advantage of harvesting at the different time points. For fecal samples, we typically harvest at days one, two, three, and sometimes up to five or seven, depending what our targets are. Awesome. Another question. Uh, can you do the entire prospector workflow anaerobically? Yes. So our prospector, I don't know if it was clear from this image here, it actually is located inside our anaerobic chamber. So it lives there. We do recommend using a sulfide um, column to deplete those just for the safety of the electronics in there. But we do the entire workflow inside, literally from homogenizing our bacterial pellets to making our arrays, to screening them, to doing the transfer, all the way to the MALDI isolation um, and streaking. We do it all in here. The only point we actually end up taking the sample out is when we are ready to put it on the MALDI. So, and by that point, they're very dead. So the whole, and it's not very difficult. I mean, the gloves make it kind of hard to do some fine motor movements, but uh, after some practice, it'll be totally fine. Well, uh, if you have any additional questions or would like more information, please visit isolationbio.com 
or you can reach us directly at info at isolationbio.com. Thank you again, Dr. Newsom and the Isolation Bio team. And we thank you all for attending today's webinar. Have a great day.